everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Kathy Grimm and the channel is The Grimm Reader and I am going to talk to you about my reading etc for the past previous week and today is Sunday August 27th and tomorrow I go back to teaching at my university for the fall semester. It's funny that it's the fall semester and yet we're still in the throes of summer. It's still pretty warm. Actually it's it's cooled down a little bit so that's good. So the past week I've been kind of anxious and nervous and getting things ready and so my reading has slowed down. I have gone down a couple of rabbit holes, one of them to do with teaching a little bit uh, connected to artificial intelligence and of course GP chat and how that will change how we assess student writing in the classroom and in the discussion right now seems to be going towards making it clear what they can do, what we allow, what we want to allow them to do in terms of using GP chat. And for me, it's a bit of a learning curve because like they have, apparently there's these programs, one of them is called Grammarly that helps, like helps your writing. And I actually downloaded it just to see what we're dealing with here. And I find it incredibly annoying because it's always making suggestions that Sometimes, okay, okay, I'm not very good with commas, so that's nice, I guess. It tells me where to put commas. Like, it always wants me to put a comma before and. But on the other hand, it pops up in annoying ways on my screen, and I just want to get rid of it, because when I'm doing an email or a, an email or some kind of, even a comment on a YouTube video, I don't really need it for that. I mean, so it's annoying for me, but I guess that's just me. <laughs> and. Yeah, I I think I'm gonna just be chill about it in terms of the classroom and and try and talk to them openly about it and maybe even just have them come in one on one and we'll talk about how they feel about their writing and I mean I'm not like I've tried to set up my assignments in a way that it won't help them much to there's no way they can really put anything into GP Chat that will help them that much. Plus we now have some kind of there is software that does tell us if someone's been using AI. So I'm not too worried because I think we're all in the same boat. We're all figuring this stuff out and it is what it is. <laughs> this is like, when, when I started this, I wasn't as chill as I am now, but now I'm like, I mean, what can we do? What can we do? And there's always the option which I might go to, which is to have them sit, sit them in the classroom, give them a pen, give them some paper, give them a blue book, old fashioned, and say, write. <laughs> with a pen. I don't know. I probably won't do that, but we'll see. So I'm pretty much all set for tomorrow. And let me talk about, so the big thing that we finished together, my buddy Reed and Reader and I, Sarah, was fantastic, was the Master Margarita. And some people's editions are longer. Mine's only, it's still pretty long, but 400 pages. It doesn't have any notes, which I kind of miss. I would have liked one with notes. I like, I like, I like notes. But I love this novel. I gave it five stars. It's a very strange, wacky, it's both wacky and then not wacky because it has the three different th sort of narrative threads. It has the, the, the devil in Moscow. The devil comes down to Moscow with his great retinue of a big cat and a guy in a, in a checkered suit. And then it has the thread of the, but the biblical narrative of the execution of Jesus and basically focusing in on Pontius Pilate and his kind of conscientious con consciousness or bad bad consciousness as to what he has done. And, and then the third narrative is the love between the master and Margarita. So this woman Margarita and the novel writer master who's writing basically the novel of Pontius Pilate. And one biographical thing to know about Bulgakov is that he did grow up in a very religious household and so I think one of the things that I haven't quite figured out completely that's going on is that he's decided to write a religious novel under Stalin which is already kind of like mm, not exactly courageous but why why would you do that knowing that the communists are anti-religion but that's the whole point it's sort of like bringing religion back into things but from the devil's point of view, and I guess Jesus from the point of view of Pontius Pilate. But, so that's already kind of an interesting thing to do and, and part of, I don't know, what you have to contend with when you're reading this. And it does, it is kind of hard to go back and forth between the narratives because they're so different. But if you remember that it's basically a novel being written by someone in 
the other narrative, I think that that is helpful to me at least. So I'm not going to go into great detail. I would highly recommend this. I think it's well written. It's fantastic. Of course, we're reading it in translation. My translator was uh, Mira Ginsberg. And I read an article by a professor who used to teach at Northwestern who recommends a different translation, uh, Saul Mawson. Um, but yeah, I'm looking at my notes here that I wrote. It intertwines a surreal story about the devil and his entourage. And uh, the big cat's name is Behemoth, which apparently my Russian colleague told me that means hippopotamus in Russian. So Behemoth. Behemoth, behemoth is what you say, behemoth, behemoth. And, and yeah, and the pince nez, nez wearing other man uh, is part of the retinue of, of the devil, who's also a character. But in a way he lets the other people do more, the other characters do more, they're more present in a certain sense. He's in the background a little bit, the actual devil figure. And, so surrounding, yeah, and a very memorable and more serious and poignant narrative surrounding the execution of Jesus and how that decision afflicted or affected Pontius Pilate and his also very memorable sidekick. So there's a dog in the story, Banga. Banga, his faithful dog who stays with him during his long kind of limbo-esque, it's touched upon and then at the end he goes he he is saved by the master so basically Voland the devil says you can save him and he he sets him free and they go on this moonbeam up to to I guess a, a type of heaven I guess towards the moon and the dog kind of runs ahead and it's just very sort of sweet and the relationship between Banga and Pontius Pilate is very sweet too it's like the typical and dog relationship. The, the, the dog is very sweet and loyal to, to, to Pontius Pilate. And fun fact, Banga, there's a song by Patti Smith called Banga that she wrote about this because it's one of her favorite novels. And I also found out that Pearl Jam wrote a song, now I forget the name of their song, that brings in the, the Pilate and Banga stuff about his dog. So, <laughs> now this is a book that because it's not such a difficult read now that I've read it once through, I would reread this maybe like down the line. I might reread it again, even though I'm not a big rereader. It's not a difficult, once you know, once you've read it once, I have a feeling if you read it again, you'd be like, oh, okay, sure. Now I'm seeing all these connections. And um, of course I'm gonna always be missing a lot because I'm not reading it in the Russian. There's a lot of cultural stuff going on that you're gonna just not get if you don't know the language. Wonderful. Five stars for me. I loved it. And I'm really glad I got to read it with Sarah. Fantastic. Fantastic experience. So much fun. Just a lot of fun. Moving on to, so I have not been able to make any progress with Jesus and John Wayne, just because that's the kind of book I need to sit down at my desk and I want to underline and take notes on. And I haven't had the time or the mental space to do that. And so I'm actually floundering a little bit about my next non-audible read. It, I've tried a few things on my Kindle here, and I'm having a hard time reading on my Kindle. Some of some of it is my eyes stuff, and so I, what I've noticed is I have to read on the Kindle. Even with on the Kindle, I use a bookmark to sort of because my eyes wander, and and it all kind of I t I, 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 I find it hard not to skim on here, and I don't like skimming. I like to read every line, and so. Patty Smith is still on here, but I'm just not in the mood for her book. I, I just don't, I'm just not, you know, mood reader alert. And then I started, but it was a big mistake to start it, even though I really want to read it. Uh, Jan Fosse, Jan Fosse, the Norwegian writer, very, very sort of stream of conscious writing, his first volume of the Septology, yet, a, yet another multi-volume long work. I'm just like, there's so many of them in my, in my reading space this year, the... Dorothy Richardson, the Hermann Broch, it's just a thing, I guess. So Septology, which is broken up into seven different parts, but he conceives them as one. And it's basically, it's the whole, it's the whole thousand pages, one sentence. That would be quite the feat, but it's a very long one sentence, deeply, deeply stream of consciousness book, which I'm down for. I'm already vibing with it. I like it. But the problem was I was reading it, I started it on my Kindle and I was a bit tired 
And my Kindle, I, I'm not really good with the reading on it because it's it kept, and it took me a long time to figure this out, it kept on going backwards instead of forwards. And so I was rereading and because it was sort of all one sentence and I wasn't sure and I thought maybe the repetition's part of it, I got so confused. And I realized, no, it's not, it should be moving forward, however slowly. I shouldn't be rereading the same thing. But because of people who've read it know it's all, the, there's two people with the same name and the, uh, it's, it's very easy to do when, when you, and so what really happened is the typical thing is I really miss being able to just go back and it, physically to the page and just know that I'm actually moving forward. It was this, I was in this sort of hell of where, it was like a labyrinth of where am I in this book? And I had no way of really, I went to this sort of overview that they have on here was sort of able to, and also I was tired, so I was sort of, my brain wasn't functioning that well anyway. But it took me a long time to figure out that no, you are just actually rereading the same pages. And of course it has the, it does give you, see I'm even now like putzing with it in an in a, in, in apt way. It, ha, it does give you the location at the bottom, but for some reason even that was confusing me because I was tired. Anyway. Point being, I don't think I can read Septology stuff on my Kindle. I need the physical book. Plus, I love the Fitzcarraldo, the blue blue one. So, it might be a birthday present, even though I'm trying to be good and not buy too many books. So, I'm going to not read John, Jan Fosse on here. But then, I want to read something on here, but I'm not finding anything. Or well, So far, I haven't found anything. I put down, I, I downloaded a sample of the Ann Patcher, Tom Lake. Maybe that'll work. I need something pretty straightforward but something that I also like. But on the other hand, maybe I should just go and read a Nora Roberts or something. I don't know. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm a little frustrated with it. So, because part of me wants to just go read read all the other non-Kindle books that I have. Plus I'm running out of time. I really will have quite a bit less time, which means I need to sort of focus in on what I want to read. My main reading times from now on until whenever it's going to be in the mornings, so before I get ready for, for the teaching days or, or prep days, whatever kind of days, I get up at five or maybe even earlier, we'll see. I mean, not that I want to get up earlier, but I don't. if I get up at four, I'm, I'm such a bad sleeper that if, if I wake up and I see that it's four and I'm completely awake, I'll just get up and make coffee and read. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's four. And I've even been known to do insomniac. Well, it used to be tweeting and now it's blue skying, skeeting, I guess, talking about my insomnia. And then it's funny because there's a whole community of insomniacs and we all kind of like write to each other. It's kind of nice. <laughs> Not that I should really be doing that instead of sleeping. I do understand that, but you do what you do. And sometimes it's a nice kind of, it makes you feel a little bit better about the fact that you, and I, I the, my main skeet or tweet is, is it okay to drink coffee at four? Three is, too early. Silly insomniac stuff, which will probably get better now that I'll be busier, so I'm not too worried about it. Where was I? Yes. Okay, so let's get on to the main thing that I am really enjoying, and it's my new Audible, but I do have the copy here too that I will dip into, specifically for some sort of vocab stuff that comes up, is the next installment in the Palliser novels by Trollope, my, my darling Trollope. I just love him so much, the Eustace Diamonds. So this is number three in the Palliser novels, and I've read Basically this year I've read and mainly listened, but also kind of dipped into the first two novels. So for me to be reading three Trollops in a year is progress, but it's because I'm listening to them basically. There's, for some reason, so my husband has a subscription to Audible and for some reason these books read by Timothy West in my case are free to me on, on Audible. So, and they're good. They're thoroughly enjoyable. Now I will say that Trollope is not modern. He's middle of the road. He's somewhat conservative. I mean, he's sort of a man of his times anyway. So sometimes, and, and the thing is, he's so good with female characters, but he is sometimes a little condescending and, and you know, stuff that you really wouldn't get away with in 2023. But you can tell he sort of takes time to think about his female characters. He's, his main character in here, uh, Lizzie Eustace, She's a Becky Sharp. She's she's a negative character, but she's she's the main character. And so he's the, the psyche of a non-positive character is always interesting. Selfish, greedy, 
um, I mean, I think one of the main things about Lizzie is that she lies to herself. So they're always sort of conning themselves along with everyone else and seeing how, how long they can get away with it. That's the, that's the plight of the not good person, at least in the Trollopian and maybe beyond that universe. So sometimes you're like, okay, Trollope, okay, Anthony, you know, and this sort of, he does somewhat put, well, but then he's kind of realistic about, I'm, I'm sort of, he juxtaposes the, the flighty, flirty, Becky Sharp type person with someone who's a good person and they're demure, but then, but he does it in a really interesting way. I'm sorry, I'm not being very clear, but, but it's just another wonderful and immersive listen. You get sucked into this comfortable universe where you know people and people from the other novel pop up kind of on the periphery and yet and someone who was on the periphery in the other novel becomes a more prominent character in this one uh lord fawn and so it's a it's a group of it's a whole world that he's creating here and it's wonderful and it's very sort of soothing i find him very soothing and i i really contend that he is the heir to austin his characters are like Austin-esque, but then in more depth because of the way he, it's all very psychological. And and he's a, he, also the narrator is very much in the novel, just like Austin's narr narrator, she she steps in and kind of gives her, her take on things too. They are quite similar, I think, much more than Trollope is to Dickens, I would say. It's interesting. I'll have to see if anyone's ever done any work on both of them together, you know, comparative work. You just sort of, it is a bit sad that Austin didn't get to write further works. You know, she left left the world too soon, as so many of the writers did. So Eustace Diamonds, what's interesting about the book is that it's a book about bling, specifically one piece of bling, the Eustace Diamonds. And it was making me think about the the other pieces of bling in, in fiction in general. So if you know of any works that... that are about jewelry or that, that that use a piece of jewelry as a type of MacGuffin in a certain sense, if you know what a MacGuffin is from movies. It's a blingy novel. <laughs> and so, of course, you can already kind of guess that it's honing in on money and greed and possession and and how how an object can make you feel good or bad because of your relationship to it, which is so interesting, and, and uh, especially in our... our capitalist, materialist world. So he's doing a really good job with that. So the connections, I was trying to think of blingy novels and for some reason, Daniel Durana kept coming to mind because there's the beginning part that I recall where the, the she's wearing, uh, the lady there is wearing a, what's her name, Gwendolyn, I think, was wearing a necklace that is, there's an interesting interaction there that happens with the necklace. And then later on, is it also Gwendolyn? Yes, I think it is. There's something to do with rubies, I think, in that novel, as I recall. So that's one connection that came to mind. So another Victorian connection. And there was another one, but now I'm kind of blanking on it. So let me know if you know any other blingy novels. <laughs> I just think it's a funny thing to think about gemstones. I mean, my other Austrian fellow, Stifter, he wrote a whole group of interconnected stories, although they're not that interconnected, but they're called... Um, colorful stones, colorful and, and Buttersteiner, but they're all given names of precious, precious uh, stones, semi-precious things like turquoise and things like that. I can't remember any of them. Yeah. So that's going really well. Highly recommended. I don't know what page I'm on exactly. Maybe getting up to a hundred. There's a lot of plot, lots of plot. And yeah, you just kind of become invested in, in, in the people, in the plight of the people in, in the book. And so, yeah, that's about it. I have new glasses. I actually, splur well, not splurged because I I got insurance, so I was able to get two pairs for the what I'd usually paid for one pair. And th these are the these are the pair that I like less, but I'm kind of okay with them. <laughs> it's a nice change. And then I'll model the other pair next week. And yeah, I think that's all I have for this week. And I hope everyone's doing well and wish me luck for the first week of classes. And I will be back next Sunday and I'll see you, there. See you then. Thank you all for watching and bye-bye.